dedicated to sustainable investing, started and continued to be a research firm because the next generation is looking for sustainability and content. We go into cycles and we are in the last winter period where social inequalities get resolved either through major issues like civil war or the 1930s. That is not necessarily being recognized by markets right now company that is misaligned on the sustainability teams is going to be disadvantaged because their products are not going to have as much demand. Companies in the luxury space, many are ESG darlings. We call them anti-circular companies because they're just looking to push products down your throat. LVMH would be an example of a short candidate for us. You're a hedge fund investing in public equities, and you built this from the ground up specifically around responsible investing. You put your money where your mouth is by taking both long and short positions to take advantage of five ESG megatrends you and your partners have identified. So tell me, you studied actuarial mathematics, if my research is right. Actually, at first, I wanted to be an astronomer. So I started my first year in physics, but I did not like the experimentation part too much. So I went into actuarial mathematics. I liked the math and the comp petition related to the, the exam process. There's a long examination process to become an actuary. So essentially in actuarial math, you study all kinds of uh, application related to mathematics, uh, whether it's demography, uh, how to calculate. Well, we used to have to calculate the reserves of an insurance company or a pension fund. Now it's uh, it's much easier with the, the power of computer, but that's the, the training ground. So essentially, it's mathematics for, for financial application. So I really enjoyed that. It was uh, very formative, uh, having the background, not being afraid of any large, uh, complicated processes uh, in, in math. So that's, that's a big advantage uh, in finance afterwards. I heard you say that if you had to do it all over again, you would go into psychology. Yeah, yeah, actually, it's true. For a money manager, uh, and that, that's what I, I tell my, my, my kids, you should get a, another tool in your toolkit and you can learn the, the finance part after. And we can see it in markets every day. Psychology is a, like, especially crowd psychology is a key aspect of investing. So if I had a greater background, still, I think it's lacking in my curriculum, uh, the uh, like deep understanding of psychology. I've read quite a bit on the subject, but I'm not, uh, I don't have it from the ground up. But yeah, I think that would have been a probably a better use of my time. And uh, the examination process of uh, becoming an actuary is, is a grueling one. Maybe it would have been would have been better for my success in the in the future to to do something else. And then once you finished, you landed at MetLife. Is that where you first as an actuary? Is that right? Exactly. So I did the actuarial work at MetLife for four years. At the same time, I did the CFA program, and after that, I did the professional risk manager. So essentially, those were my twenties. <laughs> After 20, I, when I reached uh, 30, I said enough with the examination process. Uh, I've probably studied as much as somebody that got a, a PhD on, on things, but I only have a bachelor's with a few other titles uh, besides my name. So somewhere in there, you became known as Mr. Risk Manager on the trading floor. Tell me about that. 2003, we were expecting our first child and I had become pretty good at writing exams. So I decided to do the professional risk manager program and I did the exam and it was a multiple choice exam. And I'm not a straight A student. Like this is, this is not me. So I, for one reason or, or another, I don't know. I kind of, I aced that exam and I had everything right. So I had a hundred percent. So I was, uh, I was named the co risk manager of the year from PRM in 2003. And I didn't tell anyone on the desk because I was, uh, I was trading, trying to, to make money in markets. I was more of a risk taker than, uh, than a risk manager. 
But uh, then a headline was on Bloomberg saying that I was the co-recipient of the risk manager of the year. So my my colleagues uh, had fun uh, had fun with me uh, at that point. Just to be clear, you started out as an actuary and then you transitioned into risk management or were you trading? I was uh, an actuary for like five or six years and I was the client of my first job. So uh, I guess my and my first uh, investment job. So I guess the client thought that I was decent and understood a few things about investment. So he hired me to be a quant and to run uh, asset allocation at a small money manager in 2001. So that's what uh, got me started in the money management business. So I went from uh, looking at mortality tables that change every 12 years to looking at currency rates that change every millisecond. So that was a good change and fitted my personality much better than the, the slow moving world of uh, of uh, mortality tables. So you didn't do any investment management or trading when you were at MetLife? Nope. So your first time was when you were recruited. And, and who? what was the name of the investment house you went to? The company was called Elantis, part of the Desjardins Group. That's when I started in 2001. You eventually ended up at Fiera Capital, which is one of the three largest asset managers in Canada. What was your intermediate role there that you got into Fiera? In 2001, I got recruited by Atlantis and they said, you can run a Canadian equity quant product and do the tactical asset allocation. So essentially, I was building models. And the move to Fiera is that this company was acquired by Fiera in 2003. And it was the the initial start of Fiera. So I think we were about 80 employees at Atlantis and 40 of us moved to Fiera in 2003 to start the company, which was small at the time, managing about 5 billion of assets. Now it's probably in the 100 to 150 billion of assets. So that the move was a, an acquisition. And I think I was on the lucky side of the ledger to move from a to move from Atlantis to, to Fiera. So then you were at Fiera for a good long time. Ultimately, your last role there for a number of years was the chief investment officer. But did you have a number of intermediate roles? I did. It was an amazing ride. I did all kinds of things, but I always kept a PL with a, a macro investment approach slash quant approach. So uh, we launched a bunch of different strategies throughout the Throughout the period, we launched a couple of hedge funds in 2005, an infrastructure strategy in 2008, private lending in 2010, real estate in 2012, agriculture in 2017, and even in 2020, which is when I left, the last thing of significance is we launched a multi-strategy impact fund that I piloted and that gave me kind of the fiber to go into sustainable investing. And at Fiera, we became UN PRI signatories in 2009. And that was my first real foray to sustainable investing. And at first, it was more of a box checking exercise. But in 2014, I started really believing in it. And then I started working with the Heather Cook and Jonathan Lewis, that's where I got really more interested and they were leaders uh, from my standpoint. So as the CIO of a multi-boutique operation, I had to get the different teams to implement their better ESG uh, practices. And it wasn't that easy at that point. Most people just wanted to slap a label on their, uh, their strategy and say, oh, I'm ESG, I look at governance. So I, I thought that we could do uh, we could do better than that. Right. What was the cultural motivation or impetus behind Fira becoming a signatory? Was it pure marketing? Yeah. At that point, the impetus was that there was a client, Daniel Simard, who was the leader of that client, told us you should be looking into it. That's how we got interested and got better at it. 2009 was kind of early. As a firm, I, I don't think that uh, at that point Fiera was a, was a, a believer. There were a few people within the the group that uh, had better 
better perspective and like i'm not there anymore but the the group has improved significantly as far as the esg is concerned out there you left fira in 2020 that was a really big job and it seems like you made the decision you know that your next chapter was going to be on responsible investment but what led up to you to leave such a large role and visible role and to go into something less visible a confluence of events. The first one is uh, I, I explained a bit that kind of uh, novelties that we entered into throughout uh, my 17 years, 18 years out there. And starting in 2018, the, the mood towards launching new strategies was kind of uh, changing. So I had a lot, I didn't have as much fun. And I was more of the fireman of the moment to kind of try to fix uh, strategies that work working not as well so it wasn't as much fun i'm more of a builder than i am a a, a fireman so that part didn't make me uh, as happy as uh, as i as i was previously and uh, i wanted to do more on sustainability and on impact and i i got the got the fever to to, to move and, and do more so that's when i decided to leave essentially and we agreed on a smooth uh, departure and as soon as i left i joined sms with the goal of creating a money manager which is now nordis that's going to be dedicated that is dedicated to sustainable investing and throughout my period at fiera i had helped build many different groups and i was always a contributor bringing in the money helping uh, structuring but never the leader of those specific groups so i have the opportunity at this point with nordis to be one of the leaders of that group and also trying to be closer to uh, making a difference uh, in money management you're often very far from uh, from the ultimate impact on people's lives. And some of my favorite clients were uh, religious organizations because I thought that I was making a difference for them. Whereas when you're dealing with a large organization that has internal staff to do things, like they don't really need you. They use you as uh, for your, your skills in a specific aspect, but more as a mercenary. So I thought that being closer to having a real impact on people's lives and on, and on the future was uh, was the time for me. I, I was the right age, the right experience, uh, like the timing wa was perfect. Just for people listening, you went and joined, you referred to as SMS, and that stands for Sustainable Market Strategies. And Francois Bouton de Fren, uh, he contacted, he described sustainable market strategies as the BCA of sustainable investment. Honestly, never heard of it before, but that's a Canadian research firm. It's a very well known macro research firm that has roots, I think, in the 1950s. So we try to be very humbly because we're not as big as, as BCA, but we try to do the same thing, but for sustainable investing. You mentioned that Francois Bouton, the friend, called you. You said, you know, you had two proposals, this one and another one once you left Fiera. And after you talked with Francois, you knew right away that that's what you wanted to do. What happened in that conversation that you knew that that was what your next move was? As I said earlier, I was ready for a challenge. I thought I was the right age, the the, the right knowledge, uh, and the fit seemed to be good. I was ready for an entrepreneurial move. I could have had another job, kind of a similar work than I did in the past, but not building it from scratch. So I was ready to to build it from scratch. And Francois is a, like, I don't think I could have started it on my own. But Francois and Felix were good matches for me. He's more of the uh, outgoing go-getter. Uh, I'm more of the cerebral person. And Felix is more of the engineer type. So we have a good mix, the three of us at the start. And then we added more people. So it was just the the right time, the right place, the right opportunity in, in the right field. So, yeah, it's uh, I didn't think very long. I didn't listen to many, many different people. You set up Nordis Capital from the ground up, but specifically it was uh, created, you know, to invest, uh, to do a responsible investment in public equities. So 
explain that to me. Is there anybody else who's really started specifically like that? I think in the UK, there's a, a shop that we respect that's called Web, W-H-E-B, that is doing something that they've been doing it for a much longer time, but uh, I think they started in 2012. But they are doing something similar as we are. I think their our goal is more is wider than what they are doing. So we're doing public equity, but we will uh, enter other other strategies as we evolve if we are successful. And we are running more strategies than than, than they are, uh, just the way that uh, that we're that we're structured. I've been told you are known for being early in trends. Tell me yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit too early. Well, the, the, the first one at Fiera is we went into uh, private assets. So in 20, 2008, going into private debt, uh, infrastructure, and so on and so forth was a bit too early. So we had to go and explain to people, and now everybody's invested in those things. So I think it's the it's kind of the same thing. And one other element is uh, uh, we I think it was in 2007 uh, the VIX futures started to trade, and we had a client that wanted to protect its downside uh, without having to eliminate its, its current position. So we built something where we were essentially going long VIX futures and managing around it. By then, the VIX futures were trading two lots by three lots. And now it's one of the biggest product in the world and it's it's trading like a huge amount. So I was a bit too early and we stopped that strategy uh, earlier because there wasn't an event that took place to, to warrant uh, buying insurance, essentially. Yeah, timing is everything, as they say, huh? Hopefully, with sustainable investing in what we're doing, we're not too early in that trend. Yeah, I think the key is to be early, but not not too early. <laughs> yeah, timing is everything. So let's get into Nordis now. Give me a high-level introduction, maybe at the 10,000-meter view, overview of Nordis Capital, you know, the mission. Let's start at the top of the mission, and then maybe you can touch on, you know, the number of funds you have and the key strategies uh, and so forth. Yeah, okay. So uh, Nordis, we're a young startup. We got regulatory approval as a money manager in July of 2021. And our goal is to move capital to contribute against the fight for climate change and social inequality. So that's the goal of Sustainable Market Strategies, the research firm, and that's the goal of Nordis Capital. Everything we do is in relation to that objective. I'm one of five managing partners, and my role is to essentially contribute everywhere because there's only eight of us overall. But specifically, like my job is to establish the vision of our investment platform. And our sandbox for now is global equities. So we manage 12 strategies, including five that are in funds available to Canadian qualified investors. It may seem like a lot, but uh, as I explain our process in, in the future, you'll understand. So there's three absolute return strategy, a long short, a market neutral, a short bias. We have three regional strategies, a global developed strategy, a US equity, an EFI strategy. We have an impact aligned fund, and we have five thematic strategies, energy transition, natural capital, the combination of those two that we call environment. Then we have leave no person behind, which is the confluence of education, income, and health. And finally, we have a deglobalization strategy that crosses uh, through all of the, our different thematics. What do you benchmark against in terms of your target returns? What do you tell investors for your funds? Yeah, so for the absolute return strategies, we try to do like inflation plus five as our target. For the regional strategies, global developed is benched on the MSCI world. US is the S&P 500 and EFI or international is the MSCI EFI. For the impact fund, it's the MSCI ACWI because we have more uh, of a like we're trading more the emerging markets there. 
And for the five thematic strategies, our goal is to beat the MSCI world with significant active risk, but we are looking to, and we are not using uh, benchmarks that are uh, not like fossil fuel free or things like that. We think uh, that in the long term, our strategies are going to beat the, the benchmarks uh, without constraints. Who are your investors? I know it's somewhat early doors for you, but who are your investors comprised of? So it's a combination of uh, local institutional investors as well as high net worth individuals. So it's like we don't have a, a lot. The, the spot where we have the most success is in succession. So many people like in their 70s or 80s that have accumulated significant wealth and either pass away or pass the baton to the next generation. Typically, we do extremely well with those kind of clients because they fit with what we're trying to achieve. They're younger, but they have significant amounts. So they're willing to, to, to work with a manager that is dedicated, that doesn't have a 10-year track record going for it. And do you publish your, your total AUM? We do. Uh, we're managing approximately $100 million, uh, Canadian dollars. What's the journey been like starting and growing Nordis you know, from zero following your previous role as a CIO, a huge um, multi-billion asset manager? It's been amazing. It's always difficult to, to start from scratch. You have to be ready. You're not going to be, uh, people are not going to serve you dinner or things like that on a plate. That's not how it goes. You learn to be self-sufficient. In 2020, there were only three of us. So I realized how much support I used to have at Fiera. So when I wanted to do a presentation, I would just outline it and say what it should look like. A colleague would create it. I would comment at the end and it would be ready to go. Now I build my own spreadsheet, build my own charts, do my own presentation. I put stuff in the CRM, but this is, this is very empowering. It, it takes a specific personality to do that, but that's, that's me. So it fits very well. The one thing though is uh, I'd help many groups get started at Fiera, as I, as I told before, and I always told them the most difficult thing is to get sufficient assets to be self-sufficient. I knew it when I started. I told my colleagues it would be hard, but even though I knew it, I kind of hoped that we would be special. It's a long project to build a money manager, so I think it's going to be like 10, 15 years from 2020 to achieve what we want to do. But the cool thing is we're, I think we're building it the right way, at least the way we want it. We're dedicated to sustainable investing. We started and continue to be a research firm. So I think this is a very powerful combination because the next generation is looking for sustainability and content. I think they're not just looking at numbers and give me a good return. They want to have a little bit more than that. So we are building the firm to be able to accommodate for, for such an approach. So I have to ask you, at Nordis, you are known as Captain Nordis. It's even on your company pitch deck, right? So Captain Nordis, what does Captain Nordis do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, uh, I do quite a few things, but uh, first thing is markets trying to uh, identify what should work, what is not going to work. Then I lead two of our internal committee, the Tuesday money management committee and the Wednesday research committee. So that, that occupies me trying to get clients into the products, so a little bit of marketing, also a little bit of tutoring for the uh, our younger team members. When I'm not at work, typically uh, on my train ride back home, I try to think of the, the structure of our companies, try to find new ways of interacting. Our approach to, uh, to making money and to be successful is through having our own strategies, but also collaborating with others. For example, we're currently looking at uh, 
carbon credit fund. So that's something that we will be partnering with someone. We're working with the, a group that is going that is using our investment universe through an AI approach to try to, to generate alpha. So as I said before, we have to be innovative. And uh, that's essentially trying to be innovative and surviving while we uh, we get a, a longer term track record going. So you got more than one ball in the air. So <laughs> For sure. As I understand it, your investment approach and theory of change is based on the belief that there are five ESG megatrends and that these megatrends are going to transform economies and societies and that these five megatrends are currently underappreciated by market participants. So take me through these five megatrends and explain how do you use them to develop your investment ideas? Yeah, very good question. Uh, thanks, Scott. So the first megatrend is achieving the energy transition. This one is probably the the most recognized. So we're looking at companies that have solutions for moving the world towards a greener economy, essentially. So we split that into four uh, sub-elements, sustainable transportation, transition commodities, building solutions, and alternative energy. So that one, it's kind of, a, it's in play. Uh, we're heavily invested into that uh, that thematic. I think it's going to be with us for the next 5, 10, 15 years until we we find solutions or, or we adapt. So the second one is protecting natural capital. This one is, uh, is a little bit not as well recognized by the markets, but essentially it's a water, pollution control, circular economy, forestry, Using nature to, uh, to, to, to kind of continue to, to be able to live on the planet. So that's another thematic that I think is going to be growing. We're going to be valuing nature, uh, much more in the future and financial markets will. The third one is leaving no person behind. That's the, the social aspect. It's a combination of education, health and income. So we're looking to identify companies that are treating their employees well, companies that have solutions on the on the healthcare space, and I'm a big fan of uh, of Neil Howe of the Fort Turning. He's the guy that coined the term uh, millennials, and he has just published a book recently called The Fort Turning Is Here, where he posits that historically we go into cycles and we are in the kind of last uh, period, the winter period where the social inequalities get resolved either through major issues like a, like a war, like the, the civil war or the 1930s, or they just get resolved themselves. So uh, taking into account the societies is, is important for us. So that's the third. That one is not necessarily being recognized by, by markets right now. The other one is building better markets. So that's company structures, that's governance. On the positive side, it's companies that have sustainability DNA. So they take into account all stakeholders and they also take into account the environment within their approach. It's also a, a good uh, ground to identify short, uh, short selling companies, building better markets. Just an example of that is uh, the SPACs, like when there was a big SPACs, uh, fever a few well in 2021 we were really against that we thought that it was just favoring the sponsors and the the bag holders were essentially the investors and the last one uh, we call it productivity with purpose essentially it's finding responsible technologies that are advancing us so it could be quantum computing just to uh, things that are going to be improving for our buildings, better designs and things like that. So those are the five thematics. I'd say number one and number five are the ones that are most in play right now. So achieving the energy transition and responsible technology, the market is recognizing them. And one of our goal is to make sure that we are in tune with those and we map companies to those specific thematics. So we are investing along those five thematics. So why do you believe 
the markets haven't yet priced in these megatrends? The first one, it is being priced right now. So I think it's just a matter of recognizing the need for it. It took a while before uh, the energy transition got going. I think a similar situation is taking place in protecting natural capital. Uh, there was the re most recent COP, uh, I think COP 15 on biodiversity that starts to look at natural capital in a, in a more appropriate fashion. So it takes time. A trend is not a one-year thing. And the social aspect, like leaving no person behind, I think this one is just going to happen in a boom. So it's going to happen more quickly. So you need to be ready for it. You need to have done your homework. But investing in it right now is probably not being reflected by capital markets. What's the evidence that you see that these megatrends haven't been priced into the market yet? At valuation. So the, the price of companies in the natural capital space are trading at low multiple, even though we're seeing interesting growth potential. An example of that is forestry. Like forestry trades at low multiple these days, even though the, the trees can be monetized in, in different ways if you're looking for net zero and things like that. So I think it takes time to be recognized, but once it does, it moves. And we've seen the, the energy transition like being recognized much faster, especially like Tesla is a, is a big example of a name within the energy transition that is being recognized and trading at the high multiple because it's going to change the world and it's going to have more demand for its product and things like that. Describe a few of the key differences on how this approach that you're taking with these megatrends differs from the rest of the industry. Yeah, so the, the first step is identifying the megatrends and the, the most differentiating aspect of our investment process is we start with sustainability. So I think it's our biggest differentiating factor. Along the megatrends, we start with the 3,000 companies that are in the MSCI Acqui, and they can fall into three groups a long, a neutral, or a short. So you're either in my long universe where I can invest in that company, in the neutral space where we don't touch, it's as if it doesn't exist, or you can be in the in the short universe. So along the five thematics, once we've done that, we do a double materiality. So we first look at product and services, then we look at operations. So on the product and services, you can be a one, if you're in the HVAC business or the alternative energy business, you're going to be a one. You can be a zero where your product is neither offensive nor defensive. Could be like uh, tires for cars. Or you could be a minus one if you're in the gambling world or in tobacco. And we do the same thing for operations. So your operations is either a leader. A company like Bridgestone, for example, that produces tire is a real leader in terms of employee treatment, in terms of looking at the environment. You can be neutral or you can be a laggard. So our investment universe along the five thematics is looking at the companies that are overall positive. So either a leader in products or services or a leader in operations or on the short side, it's uh, either you're a laggard in one or the other. So I'll give you a few examples so that uh, it's pretty easy to understand. So Carrier Global is mapping along the energy transition. It's an HVAC uh, company. It has a positive product and a neutral operation. So Carrier Global is in my uh, long universe. Bridgestone produces tires. It's a neutral product, but it's a leader in operations. Bridgestone is also in my long universe. Tesla is a positive on product because it has electric cars, but it's a negative on operations because it has governance and employee issues. So Tesla is a plus one, minus one, equals zero. We're not touching Tesla. It's not like we're, we're not long, we're not short, we're not touching it. And DoorDash, it's a short candidate because it, as kind of neutral to negative products, but its operation to us are negative because they're not treating their employees well. Uh, they're trying to eliminate them being employees and so on and so forth. And Altria 
which uh, produces cigarette, is also a short candidate because it's negative on product uh, and negative to neutral on, on operation. So we split the world essentially. It gets to be black, gray, or white, and we only touch on the long side the black and uh, on the short side the white, and we don't touch the gray. So that our investment process is pretty, like it's very square. Uh, you're either potentially long or potentially short, but you can't be both at the same time. It's not the ESG integration. It's a ESG mapping that starts the investment process. Now I want to get in the weeds and drill down on both your short bias fund and the long short fund that you have. So can you describe the process and methodology that you deploy to establish your investment universe all the way down to how you develop conviction and select the individual shares in your portfolio and, and provide some examples of the companies you've invested in and how you got there using this methodology. The investment process, the first step is establishing the investment universe along the five thematics that, uh, that I've discussed before. So the, the process of looking at double materiality operations and products splitting the the world into long neutral or potential short so we start with 3000 potential names on the sustainability side we reduce that to 450 on the long side 150 on the short side so those are the candidates my sandbox to invest is the 450 companies that are aligned on the long side with sustainability and the 150 companies that are misaligned on the short side that becomes our toolbox. The next step is we do macro. I've been a macro investor all my professional life, essentially. So we try to identify the characteristics that are going to be rewarded or, or like disavowed. Uh, so what our, our portfolio should be positioned in, ter in terms of exposure. So that determines the weight in portfolios. And then we look at fundamental analysis typical bottom-up analysis. Our macro work is a combination of judgmental, fundamental, 12 to 18 months macro scenarios combined with technical. And our bottom-up work is a combination of a quant model, a technical approach, and also deep down fundamentals on, on companies. So I'll give you a few examples to uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I'm, I'm going to back up just a little bit towards the beginning. What you said, you know, you're you're putting companies in buckets as positive, neutral, or negative, and that necessarily requires you to score them. I guess the question is, how do you arrive at the bucket that they go in? Do you have your in-house system? Are you using third-party data? How are you doing it? Because that, that's where it all comes down to. And there's also greenwashing and everything else out there. So just because someone says that they're good doesn't mean that they are, right? We're doing the work from the ground up. We're a subscriber to ESG rating agencies, but we don't, we just use them to confirm biases and get more information. So we produce a double materiality fact sheet on the names that are within our universe. So we look in the double materiality fact sheet. We It's just sustainability. We don't look at any financial numbers. So we look at the alignment with our investment team, the five investment teams. Then we look at their products and services. How are they aligning? Are they positive for society? Or are they negative for society? Are they neutral for society? And then we look at the operations. And then we, for the operations, we look at many different things, but amongst them, the SASB framework to look at operations. And we are, it's either black, gray, or white. There's no in between. The, the, the scoring that we do, you're either a one, a zero, or a minus one. And there's no in between. So you cannot be, uh, you're decent on ESG. So I'm going to have you because your, your financials are, are very good. So we believe that a, a company that is misaligned 
on the sustainability teams is going to be disadvantaged because their products are not going to have as much demand. The regulatory framework is going to be hard for them and the risk of those companies is higher. So the cost of capital is going to be, is going to be higher. So that's kind of our high level philosophy. So the first step, double materiality analysis on all of the names that we have within the portfolio. And as you said, this is the key to our investment process. The rest is just, we. after we've done that, we just become a regular money manager that does a combination of macro and, and bottom-up fundamental. Okay, great. Now you can get to your examples. All right. So I'll give you a few examples <laughs> uh, on the short side. So uh, a short candidate for us needs to be poorly aligned uh, from a product service or from an operation standpoint. So I'll give you a, an example on the product. Uh, DraftKing is a, is a, a betting company. So that's one that's in our short universe. Uh, DoorDash is in our short universe uh, also. So on the macro side, the first thing that we look at, our belief is that currently the global consumer is getting stretched and it's unlikely to meet expectation. Doesn't mean it's going to be in a huge global recession, but we think that especially on the consumer side, they're not going to meet expectations. On the stock specific side, we think that leverage and valuation are going to be the two main driving force in a higher interest rate environment. So when we're looking at the bottom up things, we're looking at companies that have interest rate sensitivity or highly valued companies. So for example, there's a lot of interest rate sensitivity in the buy now, pay later business or in the car loan business. So short candidates, there are many, and these guys often have shady operations in terms of their operations, so they're pretty easy to find. So this is a spot where we're finding short candidates. Other that are more controversial, highly valued companies in the luxury space, many of those are ESG darlings, but we call them anti-circular companies because they're just looking to push products down your throat uh, you can think of many of the luxury uh, companies like uh, LVMH would be would be an example of a, a short candidate for us based on that. So we think that the from a macro standpoint, the consumer is not going to be delivering as much, so uh, it's going to be more more difficult. We think from a credit standpoint, the higher interest rates are going to hit you. So a company like a SoftBank or Credit Acceptance Corporation that is in the uh, the car loan business are going to have a tough time and associated with the high valuation LVMH or a Nike that are highly dependent on the high-end customer are going to have a tough time. So this is an example of how we come up with short positions and we do the opposite for long position. It's, it's always more fun for investors, especially sustainability investors to want to change the world with good. So we, it's easier to come up with ideas on the long side because they're going to be transforming the world. But we're also active on, on the short side. And it's oftentimes the best way to eliminate practices. So for example, if short investors were not present, maybe SPACs would still be prevalent. And that was a kind of a bad idea in my mind. I'm sure you're familiar with the saying, that goes, markets can stay irrational longer than you can remain solvent, right? So, yeah, when you short a poorly aligned stock, your thesis must be that it's on the wrong side of an ESG megatrend in the relatively near term rather than some point in the next decade. How do you develop conviction that this will be the case? Because, uh, you know, the time horizon is important. You're shorting large, expensive stocks like Blackstone and Domino's Pizza, S&P 500 ETF, and uh, NASDAQ ETF. What's your approach to developing the time horizon? The, the timing is, uh, is critical. The short universe is a bunch of companies that over the long term are going to have some issues, whether regulatory, whether financial or not. But you need to be aware of the macro environment in which we are and also the bottom up environment. So you need to have in our mindset interest rates that are going to hit you or a consumer that's weaker that's going to hit you. So we, that's our macro belief. 
So if those things happen, we're going to be winners. So that's why the short universe is one thing, but then the combination of macro and fundamental bottom-up analysis is the other trigger. As you said, these things can stay rational for a very long time. Uh, An example of a a company that we shorted a a while ago is Herbalife. Bill Ackman uh, was a noted short and his case was really compelling but the timing was bad for him. He got, he got hit on like, he's been a very successful investor. So that hit is not that bad for him, but that's an example of the, of the timing. You need to be aware. And also part of our risk management process is that uh, we have targets and we have stop losses. You don't want to be run over uh, in a situation where, where it's not working for you. And typically the, the bad companies that, uh, or the companies that have issues that, uh, we're shorting, sometimes they are heavily shorted names also. So you can get a short squeeze. So that's that's the difficulty of, uh, of uh, doing shorts. But there's also a decent reward, uh, especially in an environment where the economy is going to be transforming over the future. It's not going to be the same as it was from 2010. I think quant easing is over. So that's that's going to be probably a more, a more ripe for, for the type of things we're doing. Moving maybe a bit more on the positive side, the way your five mega trends are described, they are described pretty broadly. So one could say that you could fit a lot of things into each of these trends. So what's the connection between your portfolio and your mega trend themes? The double materiality framework really narrows it down. So yeah, you could fit all kinds of different things into the energy transition, but we have narrowed it down to four sub team. So alternative energy, sustainable transportation, buildings, like better buildings and transition commodities. So they have to fit within those more narrow thematics. But the, the key to our approach is the double materiality analysis that really looks at a company and its operations, not just the product and service. So it allows us not to fall into a, okay, this company fits, uh, I, I want to be long, like what I saw in the past, uh, when I, when I saw other managers is they like a name from a fundamental standpoint and then they find an ESG reason to keep it in their portfolio. The way we do it is our universe is the only thing we do at the beginning. So the names that are not part of our universe, we don't have our quant model that looks at these names. So we're not looking at their their financials. So that kind of eliminates this wishy-washy approach. It's either black or white. It's not there's nothing in the middle. I could imagine someone listening to this right now who's cynical could push back and say, you know, on the surface This is just a plain old vanilla equity long short investing approach, you know. So how how do the mega trends inform your trading activities? When you're looking at the uh, the carbon footprint, like we are investing long in those mega trends. If you see the name that are long on the energy transition, we talked about a few of them, like Carrier Global, like Owens Corning, like Cameco. There's an obvious element to solutions and when you look at the the names that are on the short side like uh, companies like DraftKings or Flutter there's an obvious uh, element on, on the like they're not gambling is not helping society in any way that's kind of obvious that uh, what we're like our approach is is pretty obvious it's not just the regular long short in terms of its constituents, in terms of its operations, once we've done the sustainability analysis, it becomes just a regular long short strategy. But the the good guys and the bad guys have been identified at the beginning and a name cannot switch from being a bad guy to a good guy automatically. Like we're not going to go from short to long. We can go from short to flat but then the names that are going to be long have been pre-identified. So it's not, it's not the same in terms of its constituents, but it's the same. It's very similar in terms of its approach. Now it's the $64 million question. Why are you guys 
the only ones who have found this linkage? And why are none of all these other hedge funds out there able to price in sustainability? You know, there's a, a lot of other smart hedge fund managers in the world. What have you guys figured out that all these other large ESG brains haven't? I don't think we've figured out anything special. It's just a structure that we've put in place is conducive to success. In money management, a successful manager is right 55% of the time, and he manages his downside risk well. So we're not special. What is special about what we're doing is the way that we approach it and a pure commitment. If we are wrong in the five thematics and they don't materialize, maybe not the five, but let's say we're there zero of the five materialize, we're going to be unsuccessful. If three out of the five materialize and we think five out of the five are going to materialize, then we have a tailwind that others don't. So we have a long-term tailwind advantage that's dependent on how we've identified it. And like our overall thesis from a bottom-up standpoint is the companies with the solutions are going to have more revenues, better pricing power, better uh, margins. They're going to have an easier regulatory environment with subsidies instead of taxes, and their risk is going to be lower, so they're going to be priced at a like lower cost of capital. So this is kind of the high-level 50,000 foot view as to why we're going to be successful as a, as a manager. 2022 was not a good year for sustainable equities by and large. And it was a good year for stocks, you know, that are generally seen as poorly aligned to ESG factors. But despite this, your long short strategy did well in 2022. Tell me why. Yeah. Well, we recognize early that, uh, oil prices were going to go up and we would be in an inflationary environment. So uh, we started the year with uh, a, a short position in oil shares that we eliminated uh, in, in January. And then we were on the right side of, of the macro trend. So we, uh, we thought that the transition commodities would do very well in the initial stages. Our risk management worked relatively well. So it was a, it was a not a great year, but a decent year, a decent year for us because we were able to pivot and we went away from the concept stocks that worked tremendously well in 2021. So that was kind of the story as to why we did well in, in 2022. I've encountered a lot of skeptics who say that buying and selling shares on the secondary markets is just an exchange between two market participants and can't really be impact investing or responsible investing. It can't really result in impact outcomes. Can you give me some examples that demonstrate how going long or short has had real world impact that drove positive corporate behavior? Well, what we're doing is impact alignment. So the additionality, as you said, is difficult to measure. If I compare what we're doing to a private company that is picking up plastics in the ocean, obviously we're, we're not on the same level. But in theory, a higher share price for the good guys reduces the cost of capital. Active ownership also promotes better practices. And we've seen that operating. The success of active ownership is forcing others to imitate them. So that's that's kind of high-level things that I've worked. And specific examples, I alluded to a few of those. But on the short side, people that have shorted the uh, the famous special purpose acquisition companies, the SPAC that gave a ton of upside to the sponsors and most of the downside to the bag holders, essentially – that business model is is eliminated. So I think that's as a result of shorting activity. Uh, and also there's been a, a lot more disclosure from uh, engaging uh, and a better focus on sustainability a few years ago, like even in 2018, 2019, when you were talking about sustainability to a corporation, they just wanted to get rid of you. 
but now they're all producing a CSR report. So it means that the discussion has moved to the senior management of all the companies. They need to account for it. So I think that's that's much better. Do you think you're really changing the behavior you know, of a black stone or something like that? No, uh, we have to be realistic as to what our impact is. Uh, right now, our firm is aspirational. On the research side, our weekly research from sustainable market strategy influences some of the largest asset managers in the world. So like from a distance, our research has potentially more influence than, than Nordis. But at, at the end, our goal is to grow and be able to move more capital towards fighting climate change and social inequality. So that's that's kind of the goal. But right now, I wouldn't say our activities at Nordis is having a significant impact. But we're working on it. We're trying to do it. You're out there doing it. You're out there swinging. So do, do you engage and exercise your voting rights You know, with the companies that you own? There's eight people in the firm and only one of us has experience in engagement and voting. So we outsource to a, an amazing local group called ECHO that does their research for us. They're specialists into, uh, into engagement. So we identify a few companies that, uh, that we want to engage with and they do it for us. For example, we're, we're long of Nutrien, which is a fertilizer company and uh, they Used to be science-based target initiative uh, recognized, but they're having issues these days. So we're working with the Echo. Well, Echo is doing most of the work, and we're participating with them try to push uh, Nutrien to be back uh, on the SBTI uh, initiative. What would you say to try and persuade a skeptic that's listening to our conversation right now that there's going to be alpha to be found in investing sustainability in the coming years? At the very, very high level, uh, aspirational, the issues of our time, in our view, are climate change and social inequalities. And those will drive the behavior of society. So obviously, alpha will come from bottom-up analysis and thematic positioning but we're moving from a period of excess capital where there was more money than investments. So Greenspan in 2004, the conundrum and the money being thrown at all kinds of different things in 2021, where buying back shares was very popular. But this was a period where the baby boomers were accumulating in their late work years, and now they're spending. We see that just with interest rates that I've moved to 5%. So this free money world is moving and there's there's a need for so much capital to be deployed for a transformation of the industrial world that uh, this is where you're going to need to to put to, to put the money. This is one of the biggest challenges. So we're going to be doing it from a bottom up standpoint. I've alluded to the three main drivers uh, companies that have solutions, there's going to be more demand. There's a higher society's preference, especially from the younger crowd. Second thing is the U.S. is running a deficit of 7 to 10% of GDP during an expansion. At some point, they'll need to get the money from somewhere. If you're providing solutions, the like we are seeing it with the Inflation Reduction Act and, and other acts, they're trying to push money where there is a need. So they're going to need to get the money from somewhere. And most likely it will affect the sugary drinks, the cigarettes, the externalities that are not being priced. This is where the population is likely going to be uh, rewarding, or not rewarding, but penalizing the, the bad players. You can't run with 7 to 10% of a deficit to, to GDP for such a long time without increasing revenues. And this is one of uh, of the, of the issues in the U.S. And finally, the risk of having issues in your companies is going to be reflected in a lower cost of capital. So investing in sustainability is not pie in the sky. It's just common sense of going where there are going to be more revenues. The companies will be less hit by regulation and their cost of capital is going to be lower. Well, if investing sustainably is definitely the, the trend, then that's going to also attract 
not only good players, but dishonest brokers. So we can't not talk about greenwashing because there's going to be people inevitably trying to slap a label on something that's not sustainable and game the system. What is greenwashing as you see it, as it pertains to the ESG public equity space? I guess, first of all, do you see it? And how do you deal with it? How do you protect yourself against that? There's a lot of it from companies. Uh, we try to find those companies that are greenwashing, uh, those that are putting a lot of emphasis on specific aspects of their business that represents a very small percentage. So our double materiality analysis uncovers these things because we look at where the revenues come from. An example of greenwashing that uh, that we find uh, and that our process is able to uncover, Philip Morris is a AAA rated company according to CDP. But Philip Morris used to spend a lot of money on advertising for, for sporting events. And now they can't spend on sporting events because it's, it's not allowed in, in many places. So they are putting up the best policies. But when you do a double materiality assessment, like their main product kills people and it's been proven for a while. So that's, that's an example, but there are more subtle approaches. Uh, we've seen recently, I think Exxon bought a company that had a uh, pipeline that was moving carbon within it. So the headline was Exxon buys this company as a pipeline. When you look deeper in the detail, it's a small amount and they're going to use it to, to, to do more, more drilling. And the most, the biggest portion of the revenues of that specific company comes from the exploitation of oil. So the bigger the company, the, the worse it is because they have the budget to, to kind of, uh, kind of hit you. So the way we do it to identify the green washers is an emphasis on the products and services and where the revenues are coming from. What are you doing to build Nordis Capital in the future? You've alluded to you're going to go beyond the public equity space. You know, how do you see the future for Nordis as you begin to build it out? Yeah, so our goal is to uh, to be a decent sized operator in the money management space. We want to be partnering with others on the fixed income side using the work that we're doing on our investment universe. On the equity side, again, our investment universe is a tool. We're currently running global equity and global hedge funds. We are looking for one strategy, carbon credit, which is on the private asset side. So that's going to be another one. But we're looking to be a full service shop that does traditional fixed income, traditional equities, hedge fund, and private assets, but all related to our knitting, which is sustainability. We're never going to deviate from our sustainable approach. So we're looking to build a full-fledged money manager that has solutions across the spectrum to be able to respond to the client needs. And as far as the positioning and distribution and marketing, we are working, discussing with a few uh, outside of Canada to be able to distribute uh, what we're doing. And we are going to be more active in the public space. We are launching a, a sub stack for sustainable market strategies where we're going to try to be more present in the, in the public sphere so that the, the, the public can understand what we're doing. And as I alluded to earlier, I think the younger generation is looking for money management, but also content. And we have the wherewithal with our research arm to, to provide content. So that we're looking to build a full-fledged money manager that is a combination of investment solutions and uh, thought leadership. Interesting. I've got a couple of short answer rapid fire questions just to wrap things up here. If you had to name the one most important challenge in the ESG public equity space at this time, what would it be? Confusion. Uh, it's difficult to differentiate between a committed, sustainable money manager that's just playing for client flows, moving with the wind and slapping an ESG tag on what they did in the past. And the biggest sustainability challenge in terms of investing is now the short-term nature of investments. The average holding period 
Uh, this is something we published in our research in the past is now four months. It was more than two years uh, about 10 years ago. So when the average holding period is four months, I think that's an issue for, for raising capital. What do you know now about ESG public equity investing that you wish you knew could be back in Fiat Capital when you first started to get involved in sustainability or when you set up Nordis Capital? Since I set up Nordis, uh, it's always good to remember that progress is often two steps forward, one step back. Uh, the current backlash that we're having against ESG, I think is good. It means that the, the ESG has become significant enough to warrant the attention of politicians. Like from 2012, there were close to 10 years of uninterrupted growth and acceptance. So that's if, like, that would have been good to know, but <laughs> I would have done the same thing. It would not have changed the, the way that we, uh, that we operated. Can you describe to me an example of an investment that you were convinced of at the time that you invested in it, that it ticked all of your ESG boxes, but in the end, it didn't turn out. And what did you learn from that experience? We didn't make a mistake on identifying the sustainability of companies, but we made a mistake on wind farms. It's been a disappointment, especially the performance of the equipment. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, what I learned from it as well, <laughs> it's easy to make mistakes. Uh, you always have to reconsider your positions. And uh, the way I managed money in the past was mainly predicated on marginal change. The research arm that we have allows us to go deeper into topics. So it gives you a fresher perspective. So that's uh, one thing that I'm trying to take advantage of a little bit more. We generally like to talk about the winners that we've all had. Um, but I'm going to ask you the converse of the last question. Can you describe an investment that you were skeptical of either at the time you invested or maybe you ultimately passed on it and in the end it turned out like to be way better than you thought and you were pleased that you invested in it? Or if you had passed on it, maybe you regretted that you hadn't invested in it. And what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, I have one of each. I'll start with the positive side Nuclear, so investing in Cameco, uh, we strongly believe that nuclear like, is part of the clean energy movement and it's going to grow. Uh, Cameco is a safe, uh, good producer. So we hope nuclear would grow, but we were skeptical. We thought it would take a long time, but it's grown much faster than, than we expected. On the negative side, uh, we were one of the earliest adopters of ChatGPT. And we thought that NVIDIA would be a key contributor to that uh, that technology. But we also thought that higher interest rates would be a detriment to those high multiple companies. And we missed this tremendous ride that NVIDIA is on. So that's uh, like uh, every day it hurts. What was the lesson learned from those two? Yeah, from Cameco, not much. Like maybe things happen faster than than you than you expect, and adoption is generally when it's on a positive trend. And I think the same thing from Nvidia. I've been a student of of bubbles, and uh, you want to be part in the initial stages of a bubble. And I think Nvidia is in the not necessarily the initial stage, but the middle stage. It reminds me a lot of. Uh, Cisco systems and the Nortel networks in, in 95 to 2000. Uh, so it reminded me that uh, you want to be part of something that is, uh, that is growing and that is gaining more adherence and uh, don't underestimate uh, the power of the imagination. And my last question is if someone I would expect considerably younger than you and I wants to get into the ESG public equities investing space. How would you advise them to get into the business? What would be the best place for them to cut their teeth? Yeah, something I tell my kids, like get deep-rooted, fundamental understanding of something, either in science. For this particular element, I'd say get deep-rooted, fundamental, sustainability underpinning. I started with math and financials, and I learned sustainability along the way. I think it goes, having the underpinning goes to the essence of investing. So allocating money to improve the lives of people is something critical. So just looking at numbers, 
before gaining a deep understanding is not the appropriate way. And there, there's a lot of jobs that are not necessarily front office kind of jobs that you're making investment decisions right away based on sustainability, but you can gain a tremendous amount of knowledge starting there. And uh, like, uh, it's, it's a bit too late for, for me, but I think that uh, that's where I, what I would do if I was starting out in my, my early to mid twenties. Fantastic. How can people get in touch with you? You can reach me at uh, fbourdon at the nordiscapital.com. I'm on, I'm pretty active on, on LinkedIn and uh, I'm going to be a little bit more active on Twitter at the uh, sustainable hand. Okay. Is there anything else that you would like to touch on or say to anyone who's been listening to our conversation that we haven't gotten to today? No, that was great, Scott. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much for giving me, you know, this time to sit down and, and take me into the weeds. And then thank you for taking me back out of the weeds. Uh, really learned a lot. It's been very interesting. Thanks a lot, Francois. Thank you. You've been listening to SRI 360. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to get future episodes. You can find an archive of all previous podcast interviews and more articles and information on SRI, ESG, impact investing, sustainable investing, and socially responsible investing at our website, SRI360.com. If you'd like to read more lessons learned from world-class SRI investors, get a copy of Scott Arnell's book, Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360. It's a must-read for anyone wanting to know more about investing for positive social, environmental, and ethical impact, all with market financial returns. These are the stories and tactics of those leading the way as sustainable and responsible investing goes mainstream. Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360 is now available in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook format wherever books are sold.